All right, today I want to welcome Mr. Kit Cummings. Uh, Kit has authored six books, including the award-winning Peace Behind the Wire, a nonviolent resolution, which has been endorsed by the King family. And he also launched Power of Peace Radio, Kit's Protect the Dream program takes young people on a journey of character and leadership development designed to teach kids to dream big dreams and protect those dreams at all costs. Kit recently released his next book, The New Convict Code, which aims to shatter the pipeline from schools to prison. And I'll tell you, I am always so inspired by Kit. His story of resilience, of getting back in, getting back up and really using, as I borrowing somebody else's quote, really using the mess to be his message and empowering so many people. I just, I always get excited about his story. So Kit, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I've already had a blast just in the, in the green room <laughs> talking to the wonderful people here. So really, really appreciate the, uh, the hospitality. Great. Well, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your story and who is Kit Cummings? Oh my goodness. That's a loaded question. Um, I, I like to start by saying um, I'm the, I was the least likely guy to become a preacher. Like nobody saw that coming. And so I grew up right here in uh, my office slash studio is right here on the square in the city where I, where I was born and where I grew up outside of Atlanta. And so um, I've been in this city or around it uh, for 56 years, about to be 57. And, um, you know, my story, I just, I just always kind of start just wide open. Um, my storyline, wonderful family, but we come from a line of addiction that runs through the father's side. And so my dad, his dad, his dad, and if I'd have kept going, probably found out that, you know, we're, we come from a bunch of thirsty men and uh, it did not miss me. And so... If anybody on the call or whoever's going to be, you know, watching this later, if you come from that line, you understand that that there's a, a certain energy in the household. And, you know, my, my dad, God bless him, I lost him when I was young, but um, he he did the best he could. And and many of the best things about me I got from my dad. Um, but it was a it was a tough relationship. It was a complex relationship. And so, you know, it was kind of an insecure household. And, uh, you know, a little boy trying to figure out and make, make sense of a world doesn't make much sense. Um, but I know myself when I was about 12 or 13, and uh, that's when I had my first drink. And I knew right away I wanted to do that again because it kind of took me out of right here and right now. And those of us that, you know, one out of 10 people, any room, you go around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you, one, two, three, four, five, we, we have a genetic difference. And I call it just one more. <laughs> I just want one more. If you know six is good, 12 is better. <laughs> you want to go for one more hour? Let's do that. One more club, great. One more day, let's keep going. And I I just built that way, you know. And uh, and God made me that way until I until I figured out why He made me that way. I struggle with this thing we call addiction. And um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, you know your team here that's assembled for your service and the way that you guys are helping people. Um, I'm a fan and, um, and I had mad respect for what you guys are doing and literally saving lives. I believe that. Um, so anyway, as a, you know, and then I had an experience when I was young, some abuse, it wasn't family. And uh, so it just set me up uh, to be this wild child in my teens and I just couldn't get enough. But I was, I was an athlete and um, pretty good, played a little bit in college and grades came easy to me. Socially, it was pretty easy. So I was a pretty popular kid. But man, I had this whole other side um, that was just wide open with the people that I was closest to. And, um, you know, I see somebody doing this, you know, you, I'm talking about that crew, you know, whether it was early in life or all the way up or those that served in the military, you got your ride or die. And that's who I really was. And so, you know, I stayed out of trouble because I don't know, back in the day, they weren't trying to jam you up as much. But um, but I got arrested, you know, what, five times, I guess, when I was young, and it was all just being a knucklehead. Um, never had to change my clothes, always got to leave the next day. And so I've got a real special place in my heart 
for those that I serve. Um, I've been in the last 12 years, I've been in over 100 prisons and jails and detention centers and rehab facilities and worked with over 10,000 inmates and most of you, most of them maximum security situations, a lot of gang intervention things. And so that's become my wheelhouse. And then it sprung off into a work to, of prevention to try to keep kids from going to prison because we got a young generation that's just practicing to get behind the wire. And so that has become my mission. And but I just wanted to, you know, there's a reason I care. And it's not just because I'm a good guy. No, I mean, shoot, with, without him, without the transformation he brought about, I'm, I'm a liar, a cheat and a thief. That's what I was. I was just the nice guy that could, you know, could make friends with you. And so that all those traits are similar with adult children of alcoholics. And so when I was young, it was whatever you got. I mean, it was drugs, it was drinking, it was chasing, it was just, you know, chronic drunk driver. And so, I mean, that I look back at that and I'm like, wow. I mean, not, not only should I have died, but I should have hurt or killed somebody. And I know that when you do that, they're gonna send you to a real prison for 15 years in this state and uh, for vehicular homicide. And that would have been my story. And so I was just growing up reckless. And then, you know, my big storm came when I was 23, I was still in college and got a phone call and my dad was dead. And um, I've gotten into a season, it's been 33 years since my dad passed. And it took a whole lot of that for me and him to get cool because we weren't uh, when he passed. And it was, um, it was a very avoidable death. I'll just put it that way. And, um, and now I choose to honor my father. Uh, but I blamed him whew, for a long, long time, many, many years for the things in my life that were my choices. Um, but somewhere along the line, I, I figured if I'm going to blame him for the bad things, I got to blame him for the good things, you know, and I started to heal that relationship. But, you know, he left me. And so I went dark for a minute. And then at the age of 25, God brought somebody in my life. And I was unchurched, unschooled. I didn't go to church. You know, we, they, my family raised me well. I just made bad choices. But we didn't go to church and I didn't study that book. Um, but this brother was a great athlete. He was exactly, I think, who I needed. And, um, and I watched his life before I ever became friends with him. And he changed my life by studying that book with me and helping me understand um, who this God was, at least the way I see it. And I've got one speed. And I don't know if anybody out there is like that. Michael, you built like that? You seem like you might have one speed, bro. That pretty much. <laughs> Everybody else is growing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about Papa Stark. You might have about eight speeds. I'm not sure. But but anyway, mine's like all out. If I'm going to do something, it's going to be I've all I've used all eight gears at high RPM. So. <laughs> yeah, but you got that thing tuned up right, though. So my mind kept breaking down. So I've only got one speed and it's like all out. I either want to save the world or tear some stuff up. And so when God got a hold of me, I was like all in because that's the addictive part of me, right? And so within nine, it took me nine months to get into the ministry. Okay, so this, you know, this kid that hadn't even been, you know, didn't know much and hadn't even been sober that long, all of a sudden is thrown into the ministry. And I wanted it, man, because the first time I got in front of, an audience. I didn't know that there was a gift inside of me that had been hiding. And I believe it had been, I'd carried it since birth. And it wasn't just being charismatic or I could make friends. All of those were coping mechanisms, but there was a, there was a, a gift behind it to be able to engage and to be able to connect with people, especially large groups of people. And, and it was intoxicating. <laughs> And so I went into it. It was a love affair, man. Just fell in love with God. And I just wanted to, to tell everybody, you know. And then I, I rode that ride for 15 years from 25 to 40 and had success. Um, you know, my churches grew and I started getting bigger ones. And so by the time at 25, I went in. By the time I was about 33, I was in charge of about 4,000 people. And I was tired. And so I was married, had a couple kids. And it was slippery because somewhere along the way, um, I kind of cross addicted. And those of us that understand this game know that, you know, the addiction can jump onto whatever and then it'll lead you back to whatever your, you know, your flavor is. And for me, I gave up the alcohol and the drugs, but the praise of men became what I was addicted to. I love that audience, man. 
you know, I love the way they made me feel because here was this wounded kid that now was being validated and everything I'd always wanted is for people to say, man, you're all right. And so they laughed at all my jokes and they stood and they applauded when I got done. They, they lined up to shake this young man's hand. And that is a heady thing. And so I started desiring the next big message at the next big conference or the next big promotion. You know, I wanted it. I wanted to be that number one guy. And, and that is not why you go into ministry. <laughs> ministry should be service work and lifting everyone else up and being the, and, and in the thing I was in, we got lifted up and treated like rock stars, you know, and I don't think that that's the way it's supposed to be, but that's the way it was. And, and I ate it up. Nobody forced me to do it. And so, Finally, near the end, when I, I turned 40 and it was just the perfect storm and I had started getting thirsty and I'd started playing that game. And those of us with this little difference, you know, play just stupid games like, all right, I'm not going to have any more than two a day. All right. That's my limit two a day. So I got around that by just getting bigger and bigger glasses. <laughs> and I only have two. <laughs> Anybody that knows this game is going, ah, yeah, I see you. I play that game, too. And, you know, not every day, you know, people with drinking problems drink every day. So I'd take Sunday off <laughs> or wait till midnight, <laughs> 12 on one, <laughs> not every day. And so I, I was playing that slippery game and then preaching on Sunday mornings. And that affects your conscience. And before you know it, you just get disillusioned. And I wasn't seeing God work in my life anymore. And so I made the decision to quit and just resign. And I didn't get fired and they didn't let me go. I, I just said, I, I, I don't have anything left. And I was on, I was in front of a congregation in the middle of a sermon. And I experienced the first of would be several panic attacks. And it wasn't from stage fright. It was from some things bubbling up in there that had been there for a long time. And I don't know what makes those kind of things come out, but if anybody's ever uh, experienced any type of mental illness, man, it jumped on me and I just lost the words. I was standing in front of 1500 people and I just kind of went blank. And then the heart started racing and I kind of just like, man, I just had to exit stage right. It was a very, very scary thing. And then for the first time in my life, I went into a, a real depression. And I had counseled people, you know, for a long time as a minister, that's what you do. You help people with where they are. And and I tried to help people that were struggling with that, but I didn't understand it. Had never been there before. And now all of a sudden I was flat on my back and it was, it was real. It wasn't just being a little blue and it rocked me. And that's what basically led me into, I got to get out of this. I got to do something else. And I walked out into the perfect storm. I think I keep using that term because it really was, there was a storm brewing and that dude that, you know, the, the BC guy <laughs> that God saved, that nature, that BC nature, I thought it had been taken away, but that joker had been doing push-ups in the parking lot waiting for me to get back. <laughs> and so when I got out there, man, I just kind of went nuts. And really, I, I shook my fist at God, to be quite honest. Because in my 40th year, I experienced, um, I resigned from my position, <clears throat> which was humbling. But then I went through a divorce and a rehab and a bankruptcy, and it was public. Now there's a lot of people out there that would trade problems with me in a second, okay? So the fact that I just said, yeah, I bottomed out 40, I by no means think that I'm the you know king of pain. <clears throat> there's a lot of people that would love to have my problems, but for me, it was worst case scenario, and I was all alone. You know, a guy had been surrounded my whole life and, and held up for a lot of it. And I was all alone in an 800 square foot apartment, just drinking to stop the pain, wondering what just happened to my life, man. I had everything that I wanted, everything that I prayed for, dreamed of, I got it. And then I squandered it. I was the prodigal son. And so I was mad. I wasn't like, I mean, I was mad. I was mad at y'all, I was mad at him. I was mad at everybody, but really I was mad at me. And a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. I'd let everybody down. And so I went the other way and I said, and this is a real prayer. It's probably one of the most powerful prayers I ever prayed. And I said, is this how it works? You know, you're just going to drop me. I just gave you 15 years, the best years of my life, and I got nothing. And so if that's the way it works, then I'm out. And I don't even need to, <laughs> I ain't going to talk to you anymore, which I couldn't help it. 
I'm not going to read your book. I'm not going to hang out with your people. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And if you want to be merciful, be merciful. If you don't, so be it. But leave me alone. I mean, it was that kind of prayer. And I'm, I'm now I'm grateful that I at least was honest with him because I think he appreciates that <laughs> instead of all the eloquent words when I was in a world of pain. And so I went on a year run and I'm lucky I'm alive because I became that guy. And in the addiction world, wherever you are, when you stop, you can be stopped for a month or five years or 50 years and you pick it up again and it cranks right back up where it left off. It, it, it don't start over again. And that's what it did for me. And so, man, I was crashing cars, but this time it was the former preacher. I was a good story, man. And so, you know, there's a lot of gossip and slander and judgment from the church of all places. And again, I was mad at him for a while, but then I realized, shoot, I, I brought all of that on myself. And I imagined it was a good story, <laughs> I guess. And so I'm out there and one night I'm coming home from a place I should have never been middle of the night. Now I'm hanging out in places, man, where I, I don't even care anymore. And when you get to the place where you just don't care anymore, you're dangerous. If you don't care if you live or die, you don't care what happens. And I was in that place. And so I'm coming home one night and I'm like this while I'm driving. And once again, I'm out there reckless. And I made it a pretty good little bit down this highway as far as I could to, to get home. And then I just kind of boom, just passed out. And I slumped to the right and my car it went off into this ditch and boom, it hit this um, guardrail. And that guardrail, if you go back on this road, which I've been over a long time, this is my road to Damascus. And this is where my life is going to change. And that guardrail is really one of the only ones that is there. <laughs> and it protects from a ravine where, you know, it's just death. And that was exactly the moment that I passed out. Not a second earlier, because I'd have been dead probably, or not a second later, but right at the right second is when I went that way. And I believe it's because God is in the details. I mean, the details of life, guardrails. He had me surrounded. Man, I, I, I ran as fast as I could get away from him and he was faster. And I backed up and backslid as far as I could and he was behind me. I got as high as you can get and he was above me. And I went to the depths of despair and he was below me. And I just couldn't get away from this God that I now called the divine stalker. <laughs> he just would not leave me alone. He wanted me back. And I just kept running, kept running until I was beaten into a state of reasonableness. And so I get out of my car, it's smashed up. I'm confused. I've been woken. <laughs> and all of a sudden blue lights. Woo! And I'm, I don't even know what's up. It's about three in the morning. I'm not far from my house. And I almost made it. If I'd have made it, I believe it had been a curse. I really do. But this night, it could go one of two ways. And here's how it went. So he comes and he takes me off the road. He gets my license. The next thing he does makes no sense. He puts me in the front seat, no cuffs, where I pass out. <laughs> I mean, think about how bad you got to be to pass out in the front seat of a cop car. I didn't even know there was a front seat in a cop car. <laughs> I'd only ever seen the back seat. And so I'm in the front seat right by the computer. And, and then I'm just out and he drives. And the next thing I know, he's waking me up, opens the door. I'm at my mailbox and he lets me go. And he doesn't even write me a ticket. He calls a tow truck for my car. This was the last night I would ever stay in my house, the house that I would give away. And next day I'm confused. My car is gone. I have a vague remembrance and I don't understand. And I get a call from the collision place saying, Mr. Cummings, we have your car. And I said, how did it get there? He said, an officer called it in for you. And I don't know who this, this man is. And I believe it was a man. I've got a little bit of memory around it. Um, and I don't know what he was going through in his life to make this terrible police decision. I mean, there's nothing but bad things that could happen with what he decided to do. If I go in there and do something stupid, okay, they're, they're in a world of hurt. They find out that he had me in his car <laughs> and why'd he put me in the front seat with no cuffs? You know what I could have done? I could have just, I mean, there's all kinds of things could happen. And yet that's what he did. And I tell you, I don't know what y'all believe on this, but I believe that an angel drove me home that night. <laughs> if I go to jail that night in the state of mind that I was in the next day, 
maybe I follow in the footsteps of my father, you know, and which is, you know, God bless the veterans, those 22, 23, more than that a day. Yeah, well, I'm in that fraternity through my father. And I, that was probably going to be my destiny, you know, and set this night, God intervened, not only with a guardrail, but with a passenger and changed my life. And so it wasn't that long after that, I, I, I was back under those stars, ready to have a talk with that God that I shook my fist at a year earlier. And I said, I'm, uh, I'm ready to talk now. <laughs> And now I imagine when I went on my run, he probably looked down and said, you know, let me know how that works out for you. And so I come back and I'm just like the prodigal son, you know, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Make me like one of your hired men. That's all I wanted. And I said a prayer and I didn't know it was going to change my life. I said, if you ever see fit to let me preach again, because I was heartbroken that I couldn't preach anymore. It's all I want to do. I was, I was in this just dreamless state of life. And I just was like, maybe there's some hope. I said, you know, if you let me preach again, I'll go to the harassed and helpless. That's what I'll do. And I named them. I said, I'll go to the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, the prisoner, Matthew 25, sheep and goat stuff. Because he said that he said, whatever you do for the hungry, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you clothed me. When I was, I mean, you invited me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you tended to me. And he said, when I was in prison, you came to visit me. And I had never done that. In all the years of the ministry, I had never done least of these ministries. So I'm like, now, maybe, maybe you'll let me preach to them. Because ain't nobody was looking for a drunken, fallen preacher. <laughs> they weren't trying to hire me. And so there I was. And so I went on and started hustling, you know, trying to support my family. So, I mean, can you imagine, I don't know, you don't know me, but I mean, me looking like me, mortgage banker. I was trying to do more, and I didn't look like this back then. I was a whole different person, but I, yeah, I did mortgage banking, some real estate, insurance, anything I do support my family. And I was dying inside, man. I was dying because I wasn't doing what I was born to do. And God bless anybody that can't do that. I, I, I want people to find their passion and, and give that to the world. And money will come to you <laughs> if you follow your passion and give the world a good gift. I mean, God will provide. I believe that now. But they didn't need mortgages. <laughs> I don't think so. And so it wasn't my best and highest. And so anyway, I went on and I forgot about that prayer. And it took three years. OK, sometimes we sow a seed and we're like, well, why don't you answer me? And it's because I wasn't ready to fulfill the prayer yet. He was, but not until I was ready. And then my moment came and I didn't know it. We don't know when it shows up, but a mother that has a son that was like a little brother to me. He was a beautiful Hispanic boy from Puerto Rico, and he was in one of my congregations back in 98. And um he was about 13 years old and I would preach and then he'd come and wait in line and he'd come up, Mr. Kit, Mr. Kit. And he'd tell me what he got from my sermon. And I was just like, man, this is an incredible kid. He's going to do amazing things. And he's a little bigger than his friends, but this big smile light up a room. And then I lost him because I went off to lead another church in another town. And 10 years later, when I'm at my moment, and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do with my gift and where's my dream. This wonderful lady pops up and she said, will you go see Luis? And I said, where's he at? And he was locked up and he was being held on a gang related murder charge and with a potential death penalty would be eventually as my little buddy. And he had joined a notorious gang called MS 13 and he had become a gang leader in that and then the feds went to war on ms-13 and he w became a star witness and he flipped and so they put a green light on him and he was in danger for the rest of his life and i was close to him and i worked with him for two years because he was just my little brother i wasn't trying to get into gang intervention i wasn't trying to become a prison you know whatever i just trying to go save my little buddy who was now 25 grown man covered with tats eyes looked like they had died. And we began to walk together for two years. And I said, I'm not going to read your book. And I was teaching him through the glass. And I'm not going to pray to you. 
and I'm crying, praying for him, you know, and it's like, God brought me back through this kid. And he ended up taking a 20 instead of a 30 because he helped me build this thing. And by the time he went to trial, he had written 50 pages in broken English about the change in his life. And that was given to his capital attorney for his uh, capital murder case. He saved his own life and he helped me build what would become the Power of Peace Project. And because of that, when I stood up for him at his sentencing with MS-13 in the room, and I had gotten threats from them too. When you get a text message from MS-13 and they tell you what they're gonna do to you, that's not a good day. And, but it was because of him, was, I loved him and I couldn't leave him and God was doing his good work. And he was, I didn't even realize it. One night I was coming back from being with him and I, I remembered that prayer. I hadn't thought about it in a while. And all of a sudden it was like, if you ever let me preach the word again, I'll go to the harassed and helpless. And he used this kid to fulfill my prayer. And with it came a new dream. And so just the right time, I mean, I'm, I'm ripe now and I'm ready, what are you gonna do? And I had become a motivational speaker, kind of doing some things, because if I couldn't preach, maybe I could still speak and I was doing that. And I'm up in front of a corporate event. And I just said, I'd been working with Luis, and I said, man, I'd love to take these principles into the prisons, but I can't figure out how to get in there. I said, well, I can get in, just can't get back out. And everybody laughed. And then somebody came up and gave me a card and said, call that guy, he'll get you in. Now I had been watching prison shows. I mean, you know, I was recording all these prison shows because I'm trying to work with Luis and I'm trying to learn everything I can about gangsters. And my wife's getting concerned. She's looking at our DVR going, honey, we got problems. <laughs> you know, all these tough prisons and all this stuff. But one of them stood out and it said a year inside Georgia's toughest maximum security prison. And it was five parts and I watched it through three times. And I got very familiar with this place called Hayes. And it's the worst prison in the state. More gangsters in that prison than any other one in the, in the, the state of Georgia. 30 prisons, it was at the bottom of the line. And so I was fascinated with it. And when that sister handed me that card said call him i called him and he got me all straightened out and so i could get into the prison and we drove up to that day and you know where we went we were at hayes state prison and god even had that locked up and so i went in and i wasn't afraid because i'd been working with Luis. i was fascinated and i couldn't wait to see some of the characters that i had gotten to know on tv and so it was the perfect storm but it was the oh this is the good kind things were spinning now and I began, I began to make friends. <clears throat> and the secret, and I'm going to take a breath here in a second. Um, the secret to anything that I've been able to do, if there's one thing, like, what do you do? Because, because, well, let me say this first. That prison became a laboratory. And there were 12 brothers. And we would get together on Tuesdays. And we would just dream. And we working it out. And I was, I was talking about things I need to talk about because I wasn't going to church. I wasn't going to go there. I can't, can't be open there, man. People judging me there. I can be open in a maximum security prison. <laughs> and they became my church. And I could preach whatever. I, they love my pain, man. All my worst failures are like, woo, he's one of us. You know, and I'm, they still think I did time because I've been in so many prisons and spent so many hours with so many thousands of them. I've learned their game. And they say, nah, he must have done time. And no, I said, no, I should have, but I didn't. And so magic happened at that prison. I was in Philadelphia and I was speaking um, at a, a non-conference, nonprofit conference. And I got up there and told my thing about the prisons and the stuff we were doing. And afterwards, the host got up and it was coming up on Martin Luther King's birthday in 2011. And he challenged us, go back to your cities and do something in honor of Dr. King to serve your city. And so I'm sitting there and bing, my, my great idea arrived. I think there's a couple ideas that we're gonna have in our lifetime that are game changers. And a lot of answered prayers are tied up in this idea and most people miss it. They miss it. They're not paying attention when it shows. And it showed up and it was so simple. I saw Dr. King's beautiful face and I've been following him since I was 25. God even set me up with that. <laughs> And so, you know, for 40 something, you know, whatever. And so it was perfect. I said, man, we're going to start a peace movement in honor of Dr. King's birthday 
in Georgia's worst prison. Man, I, I get the taxi driver on the way to the airport to take me to the Rocky statue in Philadelphia. And I have a picture of me in front of the Rocky statue because it was I wanted to sell it. I wanted to, to commemorate the day my idea arrived. And so I've still got that picture. It's the day the movement started. And so I get on the plane and all of a sudden I'm writing down what would become my seven steps to peace. Seek first to understand your opponent. Find common ground with your adversary. Walk a mile in the shoes of your enemy before you judge him. Practice active listening and pause before responding. Practice compassionate communication and use your influence for peace. When you're wrong, promptly admit it, quickly make amends and treat your enemy with dignity and respect, especially when you disagree. And so those became the foundation. Hey, Kit, you froze. Um, so we're just uh, gonna give you a second here. Okay. I feel like you took my Christmas present away, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gonna, gosh, cliffhanger. I'm throw a fit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give him a second. He might pop on again. Um, oh my gosh. This is amazing, isn't it? Am I back? Oh, you're back. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's the worst. I, man, you missed some good stuff. I mean, I was on fire. I, I'm just kidding. So anyway, the, uh, I don't know what that was, but I'm back. So uh anyway i go to the warden and i'm like here's what we're gonna do and he looks at me and says you you must be crazy we're not doing that here <laughs> we're, the, we're the most dangerous prison in the state we ain't been. and he said keep it to yourself i said can i can i work with my 12 he said yeah and so we caught a dream and i told them to keep it to themselves and they didn't and it got me in a little bit of trouble but the warden said, okay, you've got to manage this thing because gangsters are coming to the table. Man, we want to be a part of this 40 days peace thing. And so he let me have this power group and there was no keys in the room, no cops, nothing in the small chapel. It was the most powerful men in that prison, rival gang leaders. And we started working on this peace project. And I'm telling you, hits were called off, wars were averted, you know, commands were overturned. And this prison got so peaceful during that year in the heat of the summer where violence always spikes and it won institution of the year that that year in the state of georgia and it put us on the map and those brothers did all the heavy lifting and i got the credit and then a war came ripped through the georgia department of corrections and it came to Hayes, and we had six bodies in five weeks and it crushed me because i mean it became the bloodiest prison in the country for a minute and i got shut out and i was like <laughs> We were just getting started. Why are you doing this? I mean, I was, I didn't get it. Why'd you, why'd you put me in there? And then all of a sudden, boom. And, and I think because he wanted me to take it elsewhere. So I took it to Michigan and then Ohio and out to Kansas, into Nebraska, out to California, down into Tijuana and prison in South Africa and Ukraine and Honduras and a lot of stuff in Mexico. And he launched this thing and took me on a ride that hasn't stopped. And it, it's been 100 prisons and 10,000 inmates and 10,000 kids because we spun it off into a, a program for kids and not just the ones that are becoming gangsters, but it is them, but also the kids that are, you know, are doing terrible things and putting needles in their arms and putting ropes around their neck because they're hurting so bad and they need a story that captures their imagination and this one does it because it's transformed gangsters that have a new story to tell. And so these kids, they started listening and I've just been riding it ever since. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for everything that he's done for me. So Lawrence, when you said better than I deserve, brother, how am I doing? So much better than I deserve. I, I love what I do and it's a painful ministry at times, but the highs are so high when you see these brothers who become heroes. So. There, I don't know if that was longer or shorter or right about on time. Boy, my emotions have been from tears to amazement. Uh, so everyone, this is why I follow Kit. I mean, the story is just incredible. I'm going to step aside. So friends, please ask your questions. Start this conversation. Um, it's been amazing. Thank you so much, Kit. Thank you. 
Jet, you're awesome. You're an amazing man. And uh, yes, God is awesome. And uh, the little bit that we give God, that I've given God, has just blessed me overwhelmingly. And in the cynical business of the military, you know, when you try to tell people, hey, what's the secret? I just believe that a dude died on the cross for me, for my sins. That's it. I'm not making a big deal out of it and uh, a big uh, minotaur out of the gift of salvation. But I also would like to ask you too, is like, um, there's also a, a business and a market around private uh, prisons that actually, you know, it's almost like a, a feeding machine for uh, kids on the street, you know, people that have the opportunities that others may have, may not have, um, that are just building the, on that machine, you know? So um, could you speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, I'm so glad you asked that because it's definitely one of the, the things I believe I'm supposed to do. You know, during the 60s, the country was unaware of what was going on in the South. Because, you know, you had evening news and that was pretty much it, you know, and nobody knew what was going on. And it took Dr. King marching people, you know, into Birmingham and all the, the horrible things we saw there and, and the Selma march. And it took those things to get to arouse the conscience of, of a nation so that we could really make some changes. And we haven't gone far enough, um, obviously. But I think the same is true about this US prison industrial complex. It's time for the nation to know what's going on. And that's why you know, my latest book is uh, The New Convict Coach. You talked about it and I, I, I really get into it there. But you know, prison has become big business in America. We've got 4% of the world's population, yet we lock up 25% of the world's incarcerated. We consume 80% of the legal and illegal drugs we consume 80% of the world's sex trade. Okay, we are, you can build a wall or take a wall down. As long as we are the consumers and we have demand for that product coming down from Mexico, it will keep coming. And so locking up people in, in 1980, there were 300,000 people locked up in the land of the free. By, two, by 2000, there were over 2 million. And that was Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, tough on crime, war on crime, war on drugs. And so the, the scary statistics are for the first time in our nation's history, over half of the inmates in this 2 million plus are 25 years old and younger. So we're locking up younger and younger kids, lesser crimes, longer times minimum mandatories are sending them away for 10, 15 years without parole with things that used to be a lot, lot lesser. Um, we've got a third go in for nonviolent offenses and then two thirds come out having learned to be violent and the gangs absolutely are running the prisons. The, in my state of Georgia, the inmates are not paid a dime for their labor yet they have to go to work. And so they produce Kevlar vests you don't got to make them in China. We make them in prisons. Victoria's Secrets was being made by inmates until the word got out. I mean, they make mattresses, opticals, clothes. I mean, a lot of the things that you will buy, it's being produced by slave labor in, the, in, this, in this country. Privatization, Lawrence, is the new thing because it's such big. I mean, there is no big business where there isn't great profit. And so now people are starting to see that this is a growth industry. We're building, we're, we're spending tremendously more on prisons than we are on schools. Why is that? We're testing third and fourth graders to see if they can read. And based on those, the results of those tests, we know how many more prisons to build. Because if they can't read, we got a bed for them. I mean, it's, it's spinning out of control. And so the, if I buy a prison, say I'm going to go and buy a prison from the state of Georgia, let's say $75 million, buy a prison. I'm going to require them to sign a contract that says they will keep at least 85% of their beds filled. Now that means that they now are motivated to lock up people. What's the easiest way to do it? Drug charges, nonviolent offenses, and then they become violent when they get there. And then it's a repeat customer model. So it's a broken system built to fail. Anybody who knows what's up knows that. And so it's time for us to pull peel back the curtain and let people see the brutality. You talk about police brutality, you talk about systemic racism, 
you know, 12% of the, the, the country happens to be African-American and 40% of the prison population is black. Another 30% is Hispanic. I mean, it's built to fail. I could keep going, but, but you got, you got me going on that, Lawrence. It's, it, it is big business and it's all about the money. Hey, uh, I, Sarah, I know I came in late, but can I, can I uh, ask two questions that came up? I, Please. I, uh, I uh, kid, I'm, my, my name's Johnny Walker. Everybody call you see in the chat, people call me cheap date. It's a long story. <laughs> um, uh, and once you get that kind of a call sign, it doesn't go away. No, that's too good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have, uh, I have a question, but first, uh, you know, uh, master chief, he, he nailed it with the, uh, with the, the prisons. I agree hundred percent with the big business, but, um, I guess my first question is, is that uh, with the big business and, I, and I, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus just because I have my own business and I can't do that. But uh, there's lots of large banks, lots of large uh, investment firms, lots of large uh, companies and families that have a lot of money in this. What, from your inside perspective, what would be a way to, um, Oh yeah, sorry, senior chief. My bad. Um, what would be what would be your recommendation? Like, it it is a cycle. I've seen it firsthand with veterans of, of mine, friends of mine that you know that ended up using drugs and 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 going in. And when they come back, they're not the same dude anymore. I mean, I had a friend of mine that called me from like Florida and was like, "Dude, can you order me a pizza to this motel room?" And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, how's the kids? How's the wife? And he's like, oh, no, I left them there. And this long story, I'm like, no, I'm not going to get you a fucking pizza. You know, like, get a job, dude. You know, and, and, but, but, but that was harsh. And, you know, and I didn't realize it. over time, you know, I got more and more into it. So, but you're inside. The, the system is, um, how, do you, how do you even start to peel that back? Because that profit is profit and they're not going to give up. Like yeah. I know there's one thing I know from doing the business I do is these types of people have power. They have money. This is a money maker for them. Passive revenue oh, um, yeah. and lots of it. Even I don't care how much you raise up the flag or what you put on Twitter. They don't care. They're still going to take their profit. So yeah. what is what is a grassroots, I guess, approach that you can do as an individual to help help uh help prevent it or stop it or slow it down to yeah. and then i'll ask you my second question that i that was more related to god and i think that's really where you were taking that conversation okay okay well thanks chief date um did i get that right yep Sorry. chief date yeah Got you. Just yeah, yeah uh, when i did drink i drank whatever got me drunk it didn't matter i didn't care if it was johnny walker or not that's how oh, it we understand was yeah. boone farm that kind of i get it okay yeah. So uh, I think that the awareness is the first piece because until elected officials, especially governors, feel pressure from their state and their voters because you know they, they've got to campaign. And a lot of them are campaigning on tough on crime platforms, but the system that's been set up- Makes it, the crime hard. It, it does, because it yeah. produces better criminals that get released and they go back and reoffend in our in our communities right and so i think that the magic to the program on the inside is the program that that i developed is incentive based not punitive and you'd be amazed at what brothers will do if you just ask them to help it makes them feel important it makes them feel like a like a real man and they're like nobody ever asked what you need i'm like we're gonna bring peace to this place i've just got to help them give them a big why I think someone, it might have been Lawrence, talked about a why. We got to have a big why. And, but I think that, you know, it's not that the wardens are, are building this system. They're caught up in it. It's not the CEOs, you know, necessarily, although there's a lot of guys that aren't necessarily good guys. Um, it's, it's a system that goes back a long way. If you really want to get your mind blown, watch the Netflix original 13th, and you'll see the system that, that was set up after slavery ended that mass incarceration is just the new slavery that's all it is and so 
<clears throat> there is awareness that's starting to develop. And I think that uh, the public has got to get involved. Uh, there are states that are making some bold moves about privatization and they're not, it was a bank. The banks are not going to make loans to private uh, corporations that are buying prisons anymore. So there, there's a rumbling of things changing. Um, what I'm trying to do is help people see that the men and women behind that wire, they are not evil people. Now, some are mentally ill for sure. Um, there's a reason that every one of them got there. And if you get close enough to hear it and they, they trust you, then you will find out that it could be me too, you know, it was a bad day or as vengeance, or it was an appetite. It was a drug addiction. 80 to 90% of those crimes have drug and alcohol in it. And a third of them have some sort of mental illness. So they're just people right. and they're caught up and it's poor people, poor people get locked up and fill these places mostly. But right. what's right. your second question? So my second question is, I'll, I was raised by a Southern Baptist mother. Um, so I went to church as a kid, like four, five days a week. I read the Bible cover to cover, probably 200 times. I have the whole wow. book of Ecclesiastes memorized um, from the beginning to the end. So I know the Bible. I know the word. I know the gospel. I know the Old Testament. And I am 100% I'll admit I'm a backslider, hardcore probably because I had it so shoved in my face my whole life. Like my, my kids don't even know who Jesus is. Like when my wife is mad and it's like, Jesus Christ, my daughter's like, who's that? Um, uh, so I am a backslider. I'll admit it a hundred percent, but, but that it is what, you know, I have my own journey with God that I have to go through. And I think that I am going through it. And you said something very powerful and, and I guess as a backslider, so just, just, you know, humor me as a backslider, what you said, it was very powerful to me was when you said, if you're not paying attention, you're gonna miss the sign, right? You're gonna miss it. So I guess my question is, is that even if I'm trying to pay attention, right? I could still miss it. Like, what was it that was, do you really think that you'll miss it if you're not paying attention? Or do you think that your eyes were oh, literally almost forced open? Uh, I, I, I don't wanna sound cheesy, but forced open. By, by your circumstance and not by the circumstance that you chose, but, but by the circumstance that the Heavenly Father put you in. Yeah, Is that a fair wow. question? Yes, great comments. And the Ecclesiastes thing blew my mind, so I'm still kind of Remember tripping. Remember now that claim you're in the days of that year. <laughs> yeah. You're a better man than me. So, um, yeah, it's the whole backslide thing. I mean, I didn't just backslide. I, I jumped off. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, me too. I went over the top, man. I went into, I studied theology. I studied the Golden Dawn. I went, you know, Native I American. Too, bro. And that, I'm glad yeah. you said that because, um, and y'all, y'all saw my buddy Roots here. This is my partner. If you ever see me on a stage or an event, he will be with me. And he's he's traveled the world with me. He's got yeah. a story probably for another day. But I went in. I went on this walkabout. I got sober, but I didn't know. I mean, I was like, have I, have I messed up? I mean, do, do I, did I not even know who you are? Cause that thing ended so poorly. So I went on this trek and I wanted to discover everything that yeah. I had never discovered. And so I, I studied Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and Sikhism and, and Judaism and just all the isms. And, and I went into ashrams and cathedrals and synagogues and temples and sat with monks and gurus and I went to mosques with imams and rabbis and I just uh -huh. I just went on this journey and I just had a voracious appetite and I studied quantum mechanics and cosmology and physics and psychology and I just couldn't get enough and at the end of it full circle I came back around and he had given me my dream and I was more in love with Jesus than I ever had been and it was I wasn't a, I wasn't a now my eyes had been opened and I started to see so many miracles. I changed the word miracle instead of the Red Sea parting, which was definitely a miracle. I decided that a miracle was any time that God gets involved in human affairs. And Einstein said, either everything's a miracle or nothing is. I choose the former. And so I started looking for God in everything and it made all the difference. And then I started praying, show me yourself today give me a sign. And so I started asking for signs. And then I started seeing them everywhere. And I called them the fingerprints of God. And so I would just go out searching. And in the prisons, it's a fascinating place to search for God. And so I would tell those brothers, I would say, you know, I am not coming here to bring God to you. I'm here to find God in you. Because I know he's there. 
And so when you look at a brother and I've done work on death row, you know, with, you know, the worst of the worst, I've worked with cartel guys, you know, I've worked with kidnappers and terrorists. And when you look for God in somebody, something in their spirit knows it and they just can't be evil in front of you. I think it was what Jesus did perfectly, but he says that you'll do even greater things. And so I think that the great question was, how do we, how do we keep from missing the sign? I think that we keep a fertile mind and we ask him, show me and don't let me miss it. <laughs> and certainly right. he will answer that prayer. Did I, did I get to it? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I, I I'm just, uh, in my own journey, you know, I just, I want to make sure my kids don't get forced to have that religion. Don't you know, blame. And, and dude, I did the same thing. Like I've, I've gone to, you know, shaman I've gone, you know, my, my grandfather is native American. So you do a sweat had, lodge. Do you do I, sweat lodge. Um, yeah, I've, I've done sweat lodge. I've gone to Sean. I used to go to powwow. Well, growing up as a kid, a powwow was like, we did that all summer long, you know, like we go to powwow right. and my grandfather spoke fluent Cherokee. So, um, so that was my first go-to. And then when I didn't find it there, I, you know, and I even studied theology, you know, in, in college and I was the wanderer yeah, is what I kind of call myself. Like, cause I was like, I'm missing something, right? Like I, 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 I just had that shoved down my throat so hard as a child. And uh, so I, I totally relate to that. And I think what I think you answered my question. I think it's, it's, you don't necessarily have to be full circle to see the signs. I think the signs come up that bring you full circle. Right. And, um, and, 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 and when you said, you know, what you said, you, you're there to bring God out of you, not, you're not there to bring them God, you're bring, you're there to bring God out of them. That, that is, uh, you know, and then tying that with Einstein, I think is very clever because um, it's true. I mean, there is no such thing. If you look at it through a scientific I idea, there's no such thing as emptiness. And I use lightning to describe that to my kids. Like the electricity didn't just pop out of nowhere. Those electrons and protons and neutrons, they were all in the atmosphere. It was just when things are right, the lightning occurred. There's, right. there's something in between everybody. Like we're all far apart on the zoom call, but we're actually connected. There, right. there, there's no emptiness in between us. We're all, we can't see that matter or that energy or that force or that spirit have you, but it's there and it's scientifically proven to be there. So I'm just going to leave it that you definitely answered my question and, and I totally relate to your journey and hopefully, you know, uh, eventually I, 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 uh, my redemption path will bring me full circle and I'll find the, uh, the, my own tail and bite it one day as well. Uh, so I wish you blessings. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I wish you the same. And I think your kids, you know, I think they're going to be just fine. They got a dad that's engaged, man, deep, cheap date. Thank you. I, I, my dad left when I was young, so I'm kind of winging it. So <laughs> thank you. Gotta, you. I appreciate you it. You got to write that book though, bro. You got to write that book. Cheap date. I mean, come on, man. Awesome. You got a title. Yeah, I already got the title, right? <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, Kit. Um, <clears throat> so I have a brother. And by the way, uh, everybody, that's Joseph Wilson. That's one of my brothers. Um, he's a <clears throat> since retired Army vet, combat time, grunt, front lines. I think he did some time with Third ID. He can tell you all about it. But welcome. Thanks for coming, Joe. Big in the word, big believer. You got to connect with him, Kit. But you know, my brother's really bad. And, and Joe, yeah. Man, thank you. Yeah, my <clears throat> brother's really uh, caught up in addiction. And, you know, the family's been trying to help. But you look at these resources for like homelessness and uh, really getting people off of uh, opioid addiction. Um, I was just wondering if you have any information on, you know, how to pursue those things. Because I can call around Google and it, you know, maybe it's just my own ignorance. It's really hard to find help for people that need help. It really is. Um, I, you know, my, my roots are in the recovery movement, obviously. 12-step recovery is what broke the cycle for me. Um, and now the service work is what keeps me free. You know, working with other people, you can't keep what you don't give away. And, um, and so it, it does that. But <clears throat> gosh, I, I think that if we took you know, a portion of the $80 billion we're going to spend on corrections um, to, to get about a 10 to $20 billion profit. I mean, whoever said it is right. They ain't going to give that up easy. 
they're going to they're going to hold on to that just like Jim Crow. We held held on to that too because it worked for those in charge. But if we're going to to really you know, block this pipeline, there's got to be substance abuse and mental illness help, true, true help, recovery. And imagine if we started building recovery centers, community centers, and mental health clinics in these, these areas where we're building prisons, and then nonviolent offenders, what if we develop diversion programs where they had to go, they were court ordered to go get help with their substance abuse issues, before they're sent to prison. I'm a huge advocate. I'm doing a program right here with my local juvenile courts, this true diversion second chance program for kids that are getting involved in gangs. And so we're trying to interrupt them and redirect them before the, the, the streets get them. And then they're gonna become a number in that repeat customer business, big business. But I'm doing some really interesting work around um, addiction. I'm starting to get this next book that I'm working on um, that I'll release at the end of this year uh, is going to be on addiction and mental health. And I'm going to continue to pull back the curtain. And I'm going to be honest with y'all. It's a little, uh, I, when I came out about my addiction, it really, it blessed me because it, it opened up a lot of people, but it's scary. And I believe in anonymity. I think it's the power of recovery. You've got to have a safe place where nobody, because there's this stigma and there's this shame and it keeps addicts and alcoholics suffering in silence and those who are dealing with depression and anxiety and OCD and PTSD and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and it goes on and on and on. Many are suffering in silence because they're scared to death for anybody to know this thing because they're <laughs> going to be judged. And so God put it on my heart that it's time to write a, a, devote a book, not just to addiction, which I've been really open about, but mental health as well. Um, because that is something that, you know, is, is present in my family line as well. And I've dealt with a lot of it, but I'll be quite honest. It was a little scary when I made that commitment because I'm like, man, you can't put this cat back in the back. You know I mean? When I come out <laughs> with that is pe people have their opinions, but I can't be running around telling everybody, man, we got to remove the shame and the stigma from addiction and incarceration and mental illness. And then, but not me. <laughs> And so y'all pray about that one. But, um, but Lawrence, I don't think I have a, a great answer to your question. It's such a huge problem, but we've got to get help for the, you know, one out of 10, there's 23, there's so many more, but 23 million families out there that are struggling with addiction. So not sure if I did very good with that question. Papa Ron, you're up. Yeah. Hey, uh, Good looking out, brother. Good looking out. I tell you, working with that, um, there are diversion courts, but I think they're becoming, some of them are just as much a business as the other businesses. Uh, we do have veteran diversion courts. I like the word rather than diversion, uh, restorative justice. I, you know, that that's the term that seems to be planning the well and and just like my relationship with Christ I was restored to a point as if I had never failed and, um, and that's it's hard to swallow you know that is you know restorative justice and I think that's the ministry uh, and seeing people where they are, you mentioned the word convict and inmate, and I'm not sure everybody knows what the difference is, but inmates do what they're told, convicts do what they want to do, and you've been working with convicts, and that's, I mean, those are the shot callers, and that's, that's real business right there. Good on you for that. My question is now, it's easy to look at the map backwards from where I came from and see all of those signs and stuff. How do you get, how, how can people be alert to look for a map that hasn't yet been written yet? I mean, in, in our, on this side of eternity, my map, my map in front of me has not yet been put in print that I can look at. What are some of your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I can stick with, 
Einstein, who's one of my favorites. And and what's really cool is I put together a um, a process, and we studied the <laughs> we won't even study, but the brothers, these are tough guys. We get a hundred guys in a room, and they're chosen because of their influence, good good and and positive and negative. But a lot of gangsters in the room, and but for forty days in a row, they get quotes from the great ones, Gandhi and King and Mandela. And I, I chose from every culture and faith, you know, Rabbi Heschel and Cesar Chavez and Black Elk and Maya Angelou and Albert Einstein, and Thich Nhat Hanh and Dalai Lama and just the great ones. And they get infused with this knowledge. And then they get action challenges every day that they have to, well, they don't have to, but we, we try to motivate them to complete like show some respect to an officer that you hate today. I mean, stuff that really challenges them. And then there's the accountability to it. And, um, and I got off on that little tangent right there. And I think I lost the last part of your question. So bring me back real quick. Well, it's for me, it's easy to look back at the map you, and say, these you. were, <laughs> these were the landmarks and the turning points. Gotcha. And it's, and even, I mean, it, and I'm amazed at how amazed I am at how I how amazed I get when I see those things and they happen. But but looking forward out in that arena, God's laying out a map. I just haven't seen it yet. And it seems apparent from you, you hadn't seen all the map yet. Right, either. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I said Einstein and then I went off. So Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. And his gift was, they said, what is your most incredible gift? And he didn't say his intellect or his brain or his IQ. He said, I'm passionately curious. He said, I wanna know God's thoughts. The rest are just details. And when trying to figure out a problem, he would say, if I were God, how would I do it? And he did thought experiments and he would use his imagination for as long as it took. And he figured out the mysteries of the universe, You know light bending and gravity and relativity and time and space and space time and he wasn't even a scientist he was a patent clerk and they laughed at him and then they figured out he was right and so this powerful imagination is what god's given us that separates us among other things from the creatures i got a dog that i would die for i love this dog so much and but he's limited in one way is he lives in today and he remembers yesterday but he cannot look into tomorrow are we going to take a walk tomorrow is like tomorrow is a, he doesn't have an imagination. And so many people today are using their imagination and they're imagining worst case scenarios, not knowing that they're starting to create them. And so I would say the unknown path is there's fear around an unknown path. And I stood at those crossroads, not having a clue. And even today, I mean, we're always looking into the future, but I started to imagine and and try to imagine what god could do and where he would take me and i started to write down my dreams and what i call my miracle prayers and i started to write them down and i review them every single day and i still do and i journal about them and my prayer life became an imagination journey and the road became clear because that's when the signs began to show up so if i'm asking god i don't know where to go please show me and I'm going to pay attention today. And when I go through and I write down my impossible prayers, I like to call them that because they're impossible for me. And I, and I, I, I activate my imagination. I did it this morning. You know, so if I'm praying for something and it's my deep heart desire, I'm going to imagine what it's going to look like when it shows up. And in many ways, I'm creating the roadmap. So right now, my vision in my work is all about prevention with these kids. And so we're seeing, I love that you brought up restorative justice. We have what's called a restorative circle with these kids that have been charged of gang-related offenses, but they hadn't made that big mistake yet. And so we get a hold of them and start working with them. And it's important that they, we, we call it a restorative circle. And so one of our kids got, you know, he just went kind of nuts. They came in and arrested him and he went off and started calling the officers horrible words and he was fighting and trying to resist well you know in a couple of weeks he's going to sit down with those officers in a circle and he's going to make it right we had another one write a letter to the judge because he cussed the judge out in the courtroom with every letter in the book 
and he wrote the most beautiful letter and it got him into that second chance program. Restorative justice is about, man, making things right, not just being punished for what you did wrong. And so I believe there's a huge thing in that. So what we're trying to do to kind of wrap that little question up is, what if we teach our kids to dream big dreams and to imagine the outcomes that they desire and then help them build a roadmap to what they want rather than just telling them what they better not do and what's going to happen if they do it? Because that's a lot of what is being done out there. Don't do that. Don't drink that. Don't smoke that. Don't go with her. Pull your pants up. Get off that phone. Don't. And it's consequence, consequence, consequence. And nobody's talking about dreams. And I think where the dream comes alive and the bigger the dream, the stronger the pull, what I have learned is the big thing pulls the small thing and the bigger my dream becomes. I stood on a stage in Michigan in the middle of the wintertime, 200 men graduating our program, 40 days, no violence. And we're, it's a gangster party. We're having a good time. Crips and Bloods are coming together. I mean, it's an amazing thing we're witnessing. And afterward, they've gotten their certificates of achievement. And afterwards, a young brother comes up to me. He's about 21. And he said, Mr. Kid, I got a question for you. I said, well, what can I do for you, young brother? And he said, this thing has changed my life. And it's changed this prison. So here's my question do you think there's a Nobel Peace Prize in this for us? This 21 year old kid doing a long sentence in the tough maximum security prison in 40 days has gotten an idea so big that it shook me. And I was like, this kid has a bigger vision than I do for this movement. And I looked at him and a tear rolled out of my eyes. And I said, bro, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'll never stop fighting for you to get one. And so my, my imagination grew, my vision grew, and the pull is even stronger. And maybe, you know, we could get to that hollow ground where the, the Gandhis and the Kings got to, where their dream was so big, it even pulled them through death. And I'm still preaching about them today. Yeah. And so I thank you for that. I mean, in my other life, in, in all of my other lives, I, uh, I helped prop up the, uh, the veterans court here in San Diego County. Uh, and now we have a federal veterans court. I like your words about prevention. I'm telling you, uh, county and juvie are the most violent places there are because people are trying, they're trying to earn their stripes there. And that's no place for, for a youngster that's, that, that really doesn't belong there. And then my other, my other real life is in environmental substance use prevention. You know, I mean, that is the, that's, that's the suck that's drawing everybody into it right there. Yeah. I love that, man. Well, thank you. We're, we're kindred spirits. You're just uh, further down the trail than me, but thank you for what you're doing. I really do. Well, listen, we're, we're going to need to wrap up soon, but I don't want anyone to not ask their question. Does anybody else want to have a question here before we say goodbye? Tammy. Hi, thank you for sharing your story and all the work you're doing. I such a need for it. And I get that it can be, when you're trying to change the game, it can be very exhausting. <laughs> so I appreciate areas where we can meet and have discussions like this me too and my question is around i focus on the issue of hoarding issues and families that are impacted by that and kids that are pulled out of that space sometimes end up in foster care but really my question is around there's not a good transition when people um leave foster care and there are, I see and hear so many stories of kids who ended up in jail or prison because of that, it, during that aging out process, they had nowhere to go and no resources. And it seems like people either go to the military or they go to jail. <laughs> and so I'm curious, how can we, as people intervene a little earlier in that space so that Maybe there are some resources that keep kids from going on this path. Yeah, it's, man, that, that's such a huge issue you bring up, Tammy. Um, 
80% of those kids that are in that system, I'm not sure what ours is called defects. Um, I'm not sure what y'all's is called out there, but 80% um, are going to get locked up. Now they might not go away, you know, for a long, long time, but they're going to, they're going to get at least to jail. And so they're very, very vulnerable. And, um, you know, there's, these questions are good ones and I wish there were fantastic answers, but government has not done a great job um, necessarily with these programs to help the foster kids, to help the homeless, to help veterans, to help the mentally ill, to help men and women get out and stay out. Um, the reentry, you know, piece is, is huge. Um, but I think, you know, again, we're going to have to create awareness and there's going to have to be money appropriated to develop programs and facilities to rescue these kids. Um, because I mean, the, the streets are catching them and where the streets are winning this battle. Um, I mean, we had a kid yesterday in our, in our uh, programs called rising and he was yanked out of school by defects and embarrassed him so much. And he was taken to a, a foster home. And I mean, he was there last night. His eyes were just red from crying. And here's another kid because his mom is a, a meth addict. All of this thing trickles down because mom is an addict. She's probably done some time. So he goes into the system. He goes back to her. Now all of a sudden she relapses. They're staying in an extended stay motel. And then they come and snatch him up, throw him back in the system. So addiction, mental illness, incarceration, the foster problem, all of it is part of the same problem that's being fed by this, you know, huge multi-billion dollar beast. And so I wish there were easier answers. I would love if, if there was anything I said today that, that moved you or made you think. Um, I, I talk about a lot of things that I believe are solutions um, in this book. And also some things that I know are that we've tried that, that are working, but they're way out of the box. So pray that, you know, resources and partnerships avail themselves because, you know, I think powers that be are afraid of new programs. And they're certainly afraid of mine because we bring rival gangs together and teach them how to use their influence for peace. And that scares the hell out of some commissioners. Not a good answer in there, was there? Some of the best leaders I've seen in the uh, military that worked for me, uh, some of the best leaders were the ex-gangsters because they ain't had nothing to prove. And they've got a code. And that's why I called it the new convict code. Their code is predictable. And the, the convict code is, and I appreciated uh, Papa telling us that, is that the convict has earned the right to do the kind of time that they're doing. And they have a code they live by. And it's not a matter of whether they choose to live by that code. You have to. I mean, it's the way prison works. And there's no manual. It's unwritten. And you got to learn fast. And so we take that code, which is all about respect and reputation and honor, you know, and then we just kind of tweak it to where they still get to keep their code and not lose face, but they can do it nonviolently. It's very powerful. And so we all need a code. But, yeah, it's broken. It you know, um, and in order to make great innovations, you have to do things that are that are counterintuitive. I mean, like for me, I'd sit in a room with a guy and I'd tell him, I say, I know you could whip my hiney to the highway and back and I'm going to go against everything I'm told to do. And I'm going to give I'm going to give you the door and you can sit between me and the door. And and I'm putting my safety in your trust right now but I need to get real with you. And the guy broke down in tears in front of me. Yeah, he he said, I'll do anything to get clean and sober. He wouldn't have done that in the group. That's true. It's true. You visited with him. Sarah, do you have time for one little two minute story? It would kind of. <laughs> kind of pull Absolutely. Things if you are, I am. And yeah. I, I want to respect uh, the time. I don't know how long you usually do these things. So I appreciate the time. So I was on death. I'm living on eternity, man. <laughs> Jesus didn't wear a watch, did he? So I was on death row in Alabama. And it was the first time I had been to this particular death row. Um, but it wouldn't be the last. I've, I've made friends there. And I've lost three brothers to lethal injection. You know, when you lose friends, it changes the way you see the, the death penalty. And so anyway, the first time I was on that row, this one's different because 
the warden allows these 24 men to come out of their cells and spend time together each day, which is very rare. Death row, it's 23 hours in an in a eight by 10 and one, one hour in a cage. And by yourself, you do your time alone, which makes the brain very, very ill. And so anyway, we're, there's 22 men in white, some of us volunteers, guy bounces up to me and they call him psycho. Psycho happens to be a brother of less color. He's bald. He doesn't have a lot going on dentally. Um, and he's one of those brothers that gets way too close to your personal space. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know him, but I, I think he knows me and his, his eyes are kind of shifting. And he's kind of one of these brothers. And so he comes up and he says, uh, brother Kit, I, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, Donald, what can I do for you? And he said, I don't want to talk right here. I want to talk over there. And I said, all right. And so I followed Donald, the double murderer, over to a place of his choosing, away from the witnesses. And we go up under these stairs, and it's real dark. And, uh, and I look around to see if any of the witnesses can see me, and they can't. And so this is mine and Psycho's first encounter. He's like way too close, but the stairs are right behind me. And so he said, first of all, I want to let you know I did what they said I, I did. And what I got coming to me, I deserve it. I know I'm gonna get that phone call. He said, but I just wanna get right with him before they take me. And he said, so here's my question, preacher. And he looked me straight in the eye and a tear rolls out of his eye and, and rolls over his teardrop tattoos. And his lip begins to quiver. And he said, here's my question. Can your God save a man like me? And man, I mean, it still moves me right now. Man, I start crying. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a question, man. This is an age old question that people have asked themselves. Can, can God save a man like me? And here's a man that's done the horrible. And I didn't learn the answer to this in seminary, but it leapt out of me. And I said, yes, and he's right here. And he's crying and he says, how do you know? And I said, because he saved a drunk, fallen preacher like me. I said, man, you heard some people. Guess what? I heard a lot of people. You know, I've, I, I spoke for God and I heard people psycho. <laughs> I didn't call him psycho. I called Donald. And we hugged and embraced. And there was a human connection with the man that's hated and feared and forgotten. And that's what I like to ask people is we sing amazing grace. But how amazing is it really? Is it just for those of us that hadn't messed up too bad? Or is it for the Legion? <laughs> Somebody said it was for Legion too. And so anyway, I, I appreciate you guys have been so kind to me and I appreciate it. And um, you guys have given me a lot today and I'm gonna take you with me for sure. Hey man, thanks Kit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Kit, you know what? Uh, a quote came to me while you were sharing. The, the quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed wow. it's the only thing that ever has wow. and i and i love the fact that you reminded people don't miss that moment and i think about that too it's i i really do think that's divine when when god puts a dream on our hearts just to have the courage to take that step even if we can't see the big picture and uh, so, Kit, I have lots of love for you. This has been an amazing talk. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and being part of this conversation. And uh, thank you. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. This is a wonderful thing you're doing. Don't stop. Oh, you too. You too. Hey, listen, how can people help you? If they see your cause as something that God puts on their heart, what can people do to help you? Should they connect with you? Please, please. I'm easy to find um, on social media or just, you know, Google, whatever. But you can go to kitcummings.com and uh -huh. kind of check out a little bit about what I'm doing. And if you're interested in any of the books and um, and shoot, yeah, please connect. I'm easy to get a hold of. I'll put I'll put my phone number in the, um, the chat down here. And I would love to connect with any or all of you and see how I can help you. That's awesome. All right. But well, you guys all. have a great, you're heroes. Let's, let's keep up the good fight. Awesome.